I'm going to follow a train of thought here that leads from lack of education, autism, school in the 80s, alcoholism, through to seeking identity as a middle-aged man who's in recovery from alcoholism. It's a train of thought that came to me as I was through washing the dishes earlier and listening to a podcast about feminism, of all things. Mary Harrington, who I've listened to twice now on Trigonometry, two episodes that she's done on that podcast, and I just discovered that she's on Chris Williams' podcast because the algorithm told me. Now, up until a few days ago, I'd never heard of Chris Williams, but I've been following Helen Lewis around the internet, and I discovered that she was on the Chris Williams podcast, and it looked like something that would be interesting, and it was. So that's a roundabout way of telling you why I was listening to a podcast about feminism. And as I was listening to it, I started to think about this current phase I'm going through where I'm researching a book and I'm becoming politically engaged. I think for the first time ever in my life, which is a strange thing to be happening at the age of 51. And I'm curious why that might be, and this is the idea that came to me, was that if I look back at my early life, you know, when I was at high school, where I didn't perform terribly well, because, you know, back then, neurodiversity wasn't, I mean, it was a thing, it was around, obviously it was around, but we didn't know, you know what I mean? There was no... I mean, let's just say that West Coast of Scotland high schools in the 80s weren't geared towards dealing with autism or any any kind of neurodiversity, really. And I always just thought that I was a boy at a bad age and I didn't fit in, but then alcohol came into my life. I discovered that around the age of 11 or 12. And I remember at the time thinking... I have arrived. And this is something I've heard a lot in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, where people have their first drink and they're like, oh, I've arrived. So that's how it was for me. And I believe now, having analysed this quite a lot over the years, that it was because of my neurodiversity or my autism, because I never felt able to communicate or fit in in any way. And alcohol gave me that. And now, you know, coming up on 18 years away from alcohol, I'm still kind of battling with that. How do I fit in feeling? How do I communicate? How do I feel comfortable in company? You know, those kind of ideas. And I've spent most of today listening to podcasts, right? Not just Mary Harrington, but also Barry Weiss. Is it Weiss? Weiss? I'm not sure how you say that. It's a W-E-I-S-S. That's her in the background, on the screen there. I've been following her, I think, for about a year. I really enjoy what she has to say. And I saw that she'd come up in a... It was the algorithm again. You know, YouTube gave me a, a video of her talking with Jordan Peterson. Jordan's another guy who I've been listening to a lot of late... It's part of my research, and listen to that. It was a it was a fascinating discussion. Now Barry, for those that don't know, was an op ed editor at the New York Times, and she left summer twenty twenty, I think. And in this two hour twenty two minute long podcast that I just listened to. She goes into detail about what happened, why she ended up leaving her job. And she's since gone on to start the Free Press, which was previously known as Common Sense. And that's how I discovered her. She was writing a thing called Common Sense, which was an article or a, a substack that has since become a, a bigger institution. And she goes into the beginnings of that at the end of this podcast I was listening to, but at the end of it she says this, and I'll drop in a clip so you can listen to her own words. So, here we go. It just, I'm interested in how do we incentivize more people to see what this is 
and to sort of come out of the closet because the, the thing that is like so fascinating to me about this this strange phenomenon is like by any measure we're living in the freest societies that human beings have ever known and, and they're people, rapidly improving uh, yes and that people are acting as if and for very understandable reasons like we're living in a totalitarian society to some degree meaning they are double thinking they are living lives in which they have a private persona and they will tell me in private at dinner totally agree with you but i could never say it out loud like that phenomenon to me is so unbelievably widespread so i agree with that and it's got me thinking about why i might be so what's the word so passionate about this project that i'm working on right now it's a it's a project that it's kind of all-consuming and it's i'm as surprised as anyone about this but what i'm finding as i research it more that you know i feel like i would like to say something i would like to stand up and speak and that's exactly what barry spoke about about not being afraid to speak out because the stuff that's happening right now with all the gender ideology stuff and the the rise of the right versus the left and all the people getting cancelled for having the audacity to speak their views pylons it's, it's scary stuff it's scary stuff and I, I see that my becoming politically engaged now is a way of using the education that I ended up getting which I I had to go around the houses to get, you know, it started in, in the army at 16 and I ended up with a master's degree in Russian language and literature and translation and interpreting and ended up working as an interpreter and a translator, so that's how all that went. But, you know, some of my time was spent writing essays, critical essays, and writing something that I would like to do more of. And what I'm learning now is that, you know, I, I have a voice. I've got ideas and opinions and thoughts, as everyone does. And why would anyone care about my thoughts and opinions? Well, maybe they won't. But I think if I had seen somebody like me a few years ago even, I think it would have helped me to understand myself. I've gone through years of getting sober through Alcoholics Anonymous and I feel like I'm kind of in the post AA phase. I'm no longer in any danger of picking up. I can feel that. But I do still act in ways that go against the tenets of AA, if you want to put it that way. Which is really, as I'm learning, is, is, a, is living... living living a conservative life maybe a living a life with with rules that allow me to flourish within the parameters of those rules to find meaning in my life to become a much more a much less selfish person a less egocentric person a more caring and loving person which you know also includes towards myself but I'm finding that through this project of research I'm becoming more educated I'm, I'm learning much more in a quite a quite a fast at quite a fast pace so if I think back to just a few months ago when I was listening to Helen Lewis for the first time when I heard her talking with Barry Weiss on a podcast there were lots of names of people acronyms isms things that she talked about that were over my head and now having just listened to Helen Lewis again talking about many of the same ideas I understand what she's talking about now and that's taken only a few months and it's really exciting I can feel this change in me and I think that this engagement is I think it's going to help me to find myself within the world to find my place within the world which I think in a lot of ways is kind of living in accordance with the tenets of AA which is to practice these principles in all my affairs 
to find myself within my society and to serve my society in the best way that I can. And I think through creative self-expression, fearless creative self-expression, if we want to get into the AA tenets, like in step four, where you take a fearless and personal inventory of yourself, and then you share that inventory with other people and with God and with yourself. So that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing with my writing a wee bit. I'm sharing these thoughts, which is why I publish my morning pages, because it feels like it's it's sharing my... It's a step five, you know, which is what happens in AA. So I'm moving on to Rob Hardy. Rob is a, a mentor of mine or a role model, depends how you want to put it. He's someone who I admire and... Of late, I've been spending a bit more time with him. I actually had a coaching call with him a couple of weeks ago, which was very helpful. And uh, I feel like I paid it forward in some ways by giving some YouTube coaching to a writer friend called Josh that I met on the Foster Writing Group, which is also, incidentally, where I met Rob Hardy. And Rob had put out an essay, which I'll, I'll link to down below, so you can go and read it. But he talked about how he used to write about politics, particularly the culture wars. And this essay he wrote about why he's moving away from that. And as I read that, I was like, oh no, <laughs> I'm going about my life all wrong. Because Rob's like a couple of steps ahead of me in terms of building a, an internet business, making money through creative content, if you want to use the content word. I don't know what else to call it, really. So when I saw him saying that, I was like, no! Because if he's a few steps ahead of me, it means I might eventually get to the point where I realise that what I'm doing right now is the wrong thing. But I don't believe that. You know, I've pondered on that in the last week or so, and I, I don't think it's the wrong thing for me at this moment. I think it's the right thing for me. As long as I can find a way to continue to use what I'm learning to create something new, and I think that's where the real discovery is going to happen for me to learn about who I am and what I think and where my place is in society and in the world. I think that discovery will happen as I create this book that I'm intending to write. So that's my thought processes that I've gone through today. I don't know if this is helpful to you, but it's certainly helpful to me to sit down and put it down on tape might be helpful to my family later on when they look back and, and find this at some point. Who knows? But that's what I want to talk about today. So if it's helpful, let me know down below. That would be awesome. Barry finished her interview with Jordan B. Peterson with a really heartfelt section, which I'll drop in here to finish the video. Thanks for watching. Like in the end of the day, the reason that I left the New York Times, Jordan, is that, you know, Yes, because I was being bullied. Yes, because I couldn't do my job. Both true things. But ultimately, it's because I really believe that the fight for liberalism, and I, I don't mean that in the partisan sense, but I mean the kind of values we've been describing during this conversation, that like that is more important than any amount of popularity, than any amount of accolades on Twitter, than, than anything else than anything else. And so I had to leave the, the institution in order to fight for, for liberalism. And that I see as like the, like the mission of my life. There are things in history that have been more catastrophic. And that's the kind of perspective that I'm trying to keep because if I spent all day looking at the wreckage and, and more than just looking at the wreckage, trying desperately to try and like, shore up something that is so clearly rotten, I would spend my life in grief. And I just believe so strongly that, not believe, I see that people have had to build things in way, way, way more trying and difficult circumstances than this. And so if they could build things from true wreckage, believe me, we can rebuild new institutions. We can. And that's what I'm going to do. And I think that's what everyone that comes to me, 
you know, complaining about what's going on in their kid's school or what's going on in their company. Sometimes people that are running the company is coming to me complaining about what's happening in their own company that they have control over. Like enough, enough. Like no more complaining quietly. No more anonymous emails. Like the time is now to out yourself as someone that is opposed to this, that is alarmed about it, and then spend all of your energy and money and time banding together with people to build new things. I wish there was another option because that sounds exhausting, I realized, but I just don't think there's another option. And three years ago, if you had asked me, I would have suggested something different. I, I really believe that a lot of these institutions can be saved. And by the way, some of them, and to the extent to which there are ones that can be saved and shored up, they should be. Because it's really, 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 really hard to build new things. Really hard. It's so easy to tear things down. But that's the conclusion that I've come to. And I think the more people that can, yes, like let's grieve the let's grieve the 20th century institutions that are crumbling. Let's understand that they are something that they might have the same name, but they're no longer what they used to be. And then let's get to work building the things that we know we need to build that are necessary for upholding the civilization that we talked about earlier. That's what I think the task is.